All right, everyone, welcome back to another weekly roundup edition of On the Margin. Today, I'm joined, as always, by my wonderful co-host, Mr. Mark Yuska. Oh, Mark. so nice. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, again, excited for a, a big show. Uh, I am I am back sporting the uh, the Bitcoin mm. orange pants. So we got the nice. Bitcoin pants. And I have the Join Us Magic Internet Money uh, Wizard, the Bitcoin Wizard socks on today. Uh, mm. I figure we, we probably will talk about Bitcoin a little bit. And also, it's amazing. I guess the Bitcoin Wizard was part of one of the largest NFT launches uh, yeah. this year. Uh, yeah. I think Udi's behind it. So uh, shout out, but pretty exciting. Ordinals has been a wonderful rejuvenation of Bitcoin block space. A little renaissance that's going on there, which is super cool. Um, but the story of this week is in macro for sure. So we had the FOMC, and as of this morning, we've got another big bank, Deutsche Bank, uh, blowing up. So we'll, we'll get to that. But I, first, I want to start with the FOMC. So you know, the story of the FOMC basically was, you know, Chair Powell gave us the twenty-five basis points, <laughs> the buy Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. That, I, I just uh, noticed that I, I didn't have my background right. So okay, no, I'm just I'm shifting. Don't want to give anybody, you know, seasickness. But uh. so Chair Powell gave us the twenty-five basis points that we all expected. You know, he sounded a little hawkish. Definitely very focused on inflation during his speech portion. Right, mentioned a lot of mentions of inflation and getting the job done and all that sort of thing. Not very much. Uh, not very many mentions about stress in the banking sector. Um, we got to the questions from the reporters. That's when it got a little bit more interesting. Um, you know, the guidance that he had made for you know for ongoing rates changed to some firming. When asked exactly what that meant, he directed reporters' attention to the word "some" and "may," <laughs> which made me laugh. But uh, he also he also indicated that he understood. I forget what which question prompted this, but he understood that uh, credit contraction in the banking sector would equate to at least a rate hike, say. So he did acknowledge, right, that stress in the banking sector was a tightening of financial conditions as well. And it seems like that is factored into his uh, plans for for rates. So, Mark, I'd be curious, like, what was your takeaway from the FOMC this week? I mean, I think you summed up the the core points uh, really well. I, I struggle with this guy. Um, I mean, I, I struggle with all central bankers that we hang on every word, right? The fact that there's like this, this process now of analyzing everything they say. And, and I've said it before that, you know, my friend and I were talking a few years ago and he said it best. So was, I, I remember a day that where I couldn't name a central banker, mm -hmm. like not one. No, nowhere in the world. I, I couldn't name one. I couldn't name in the U.S. I couldn't name it in, in Europe. I, could, I could, just couldn't name one. I mm -hmm. long for those days to return. I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired of hearing the guy's name. I, I'm tired of trying to decide, is he Jerome? Is he J? Is he the letter J? Is he a pusher? Is he, you know, is he a hawk? I, I, I'm, I'm tired. And, and I also think, and, and I resemble this remark, right? I'm, I'm kind of bad at mm -hmm. q and I'm actually okay at broadcast marketing, but I, and I think Jay shares this, I have bad resting bitch face and that's, I'm not supposed to say, <laughs> anyway, RBF. And my wife says, you, you look mad. I'm, like, I'm not mad, I'm just, I'm just listening, I'm just waiting. He says, well, just smile. So I think he has the same thing. I mean, you look at the guy and he just, he, he just, I don't know. So q and is, is hard because like you say, it's like, well, I just, I just said, some may. I mean, so I, I find the whole thing insane that how we price capital globally comes down to the whims of a handful of people. And markets just do a better job. Markets... The markets are telling us, interest rates, 10-year ten, ten rates have collapsed. 10-year mm -hmm. rates have have gone from, what, 404 to 349, I think, uh, in yeah. the past uh, five, six weeks. So I, you know, I don't really care what, what he tells me if the markets are telling me something else. Uh, I'm in a, I'm in agreement with you, Mark. I I've always just you know I've said this a lot of time on the podcast before, but you know I don't come from a background in finance, so 
you know, a lot of this stuff was like, I kind of approached with like a fresh eyes. And it always was shocking to me that we just looked for facial expressions of Jay Powell to determine what's going to happen in markets. I just, I maintain the stance that that makes absolutely no sense. Did you not but, read your tea leaves this morning, Michael? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Did you not pour it out and, and say, oh, <laughs> that looks like uh, an increase of 75 basis points? I Yeah. Channeling my inner Trelawney, you know, but there's only so much that that one guy can do. So I, it's I, I agree. I don't think the system makes an enormous amount of sense. But for the but for the here and now, that's the system that we're that we're sort of stuck with. So it, it is. You know, it is the the question that I sort of had going into this FOMC and the the context. I think a lot of people had is people are wondering where the the top is in terms of rates and when does the Fed have to end their rate hike cycle. So yeah, it, you know the the context going in is. A couple of weeks ago, three or four, three or four now, you know, Jay testified before Congress. He sounded very hawkish. He said, "We're not going to stop until the market is done, until that her job is done with inflation." He swung expectations for the terminal rate, you know, way up, you know, something like thirty or forty basis points yeah. in, with that one speech. Um, and then banks started imploding, and then the market started to reprice extremely drastically. You know, as not even Fed funds futures, just look at what the two years basically done uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks. You know, indicating that the market thinks that the Fed has done everything that they can do. Now we've got what we've got is the the cross in between the two year and the FOMC. So two year and the FOMC typically walk kind of hand in hand. They're extremely correlated. Typically, after a hiking cycle, when the two year dips below the FOMC, that's the market saying, "All right, Fed, you have done enough." And typically, when the market and the Fed disagree, the Fed comes to the market instead of the other way around. So, uh, you know, I so think why he's do we even a, have him? So, 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 so riddle me this, Batman. Why do we even have a dude or, or a lady? I guess it could be a lady. I mean, we got Lagarde. And, and, I mean, why sure. do we have somebody who, I mean, I, I guess it's just what we do. It, it's like the rating agencies. Yeah. That bank is, that bank that just crashed, it's bad. It, That's we, a bad bank. We're, we're downgrading it. <laughs> We're downgrading it from from A to to to, mm. to B or even tri- double B. They're, they're they're bad. Yeah, really. We saw that, right? The ninety nine percent wipeout of their equity that that kind of told us that they, they were bad. There was credit risk there. So by him saying, "Yeah, th- that that forward rate is is going lower," so I'm getting close to being done. I'm not I'm not done because I'm in charge. Well, if you're in charge, then why are financial conditions doing the opposite of what you you say you're doing? And I, and I keep coming back to this: How many rate hikes are going to change home prices? How many rate hikes are going to change oil prices? Oil prices are down not because Jay Powell raised rates; it's because Saudi has continued to pump. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. I, I agree. You know, Mark, I increasingly think I'm increasingly starting to... Not, not that this is really an appropriate framework at all, but you kind of look around and you're like, hey, things aren't going particularly well. Why do I think things aren't going particularly well? Well, I, I actually don't think that it's Jay Powell and the Fed as an institution. I actually think that society asks the Fed to solve an enormous amount of problems that are completely out of their jurisdiction yeah. or their yeah, remit. Yeah. And, and it's because we get no action from, from our legislative branch of government. There's complete inaction. You know, You know what you get? From Congress, you get no decisions, but the desire to spend money. So you're Jay Powell. What do you do with that? You got you to finance it. Yeah. <laughs> it, but but you got to finance it, but you got to keep employment up. Can't let inflation go. Got to keep the banking sector solvent. It's, 
I think it's, I'm increasingly thinking that it's not about the Fed and it's a story about our Congress and legislative branch. And I have a great framework that I, I'm borrowing this from Dimitri and Russell Napier about, you know what, I'm actually just going to get into it because it informs, I, it, he, it informs what went on. We haven't even talked about Credit Suisse. So Credit Suisse, one of the large, you know, <laughs> gl- global, global banks imploded last weekend. There was a, basically a fire sale to UBS. Originally the price was a billion dollars, then it was $2 billion. By the way, um, this is where I don't have all the details on this, so I'm getting a little, but you know, the big, big change from the Swiss government where equity holders were not allowed to vote on this acquisition. We surpassed, uh, you know, due process here a little bit. And then the equity was protected, but bonds, you know, a certain cla- tranche of bonds, which are supposed to be senior in the capital structure, got wiped out, but the equity somehow got protected. Man, this was a weird, this was a no, weird it, transaction. I mean, but it, it was no more weird. We talked about this, I think, last week. This was no more weird. No, 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 it was. It actually was. But it was similar to what happened in GFC1 in the US around the REITs. So the REITs, the bonds should have owned the company. The equity should have been extinguished. But the bankers said, you know, he's my friend. He'll be okay. You know, we need to make him and him and his dad rich again. So- (laughs) So they can they can keep their equity. This this you're right. This 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 one this one has to make your blood boil as mm-hmm. a as a logical practical member of the investment community. If if you happen to be one of those people, mm-hmm. you should be really really angry. Mm-hmm. And you think about this. You know, I, I, I was taught in school that bonds are a senior claim. Right, they are a contractual claim. If if I issue bonds and you know I the bondholders then take them and and if I don't pay them, they can sue me because they have a contractual claim on right. cash flow of the business, uh, backed in many cases by assets. Equity is a contingent claim, meaning it only has value. Once all the bondholders are repaid, mm-hmm. right? that's the way it works. But but what happened here is this, and and there are different levels of security, right? You have senior secured debt secured by assets, then you have right. senior unsecured debt, and then you have junior secured debt, and then you have junior, un- and and there are all these different classes of bonds, and and so yeah, you could have junk bonds, right? Low level unsecured, basically, yeah, you know, you're going to lose that. But but you hope that the, the business keeps going and, and eventually you get some residual cash flow. But but even those are higher than equity. Like we have this crazy mm. rule. It's actually a law, a law from, you'll believe this, the 1790s when North mm. Carolina was just, you know, kind of getting huh. started. There's a law today that says the state pension fund, state government, cannot own non-investment grade bonds, right? Investment grade, non-investment grade, equity, or preferred stock okay. than equity. So they cannot, they cannot by, by law, own non-investment grade bonds. Mm. But you own equity, which is junior. So the, the, the illogic of that is, is astounding. Yeah, if you think about it, it's just it's just completely illogical. And and there's this crazy thing that when when bonds, we and others, when bonds would get downgraded, you know, from investment grade to to non investment grade, the state would have to sell them, and we mm-hmm. and others would would buy them, right? So they go from ninety five cents to eighty cents, and you buy them. And then when the company gets better and they turn around, you sell them right back to the state. And make mm. a profit. Just insane. Regulatory yeah. arbitrage. So, so uh, I'm, I'm with you there 100%. And that, that, I think that is what that sort of makes it so odd what, what happened uh, over and over. And, you know, this is where, like, I try not to – I'm not an expert in this kind of stuff and especially how 
law, like securities law works over in Europe. But it, it, it does strike me as pretty odd. Now, we're also seeing Deutsche Bank trade in a pretty distressed way right now. We're recording this at uh, 8.15 on, on Friday. So what is Deutsche? Deutsche is down how much? Like 15% or so in, in yeah. market trading? Yes, I mean, yeah, a couple hour, an hour ago it was down about 10, but it's probably down more than that now. Yeah. So, um, and their CDS is blowing out. CDS is pretty interesting, by the way. I don't know if you saw this uh, tweet from uh, Boaz Weinstein, but you know, when in the acquisition uh, for by uh, Credit Suisse getting acquired by UBS, uh, there was a MAC clause, um, which was actually contingent on their their CDS spread, and I think that was part of the reason why the Swiss National Bank had to go in and basically extend a hundred billion dollar, you know, uh, line of credit, which is. Which is again, nuts. Michael, this is not new, right? This is the That's exact nuts. Same thing that happened in global financial crisis one. Mm-hmm. So credit default swaps are these really interesting securities, derivative securities, that, again, they were intended to be insurance policies that, mm. that an investor could, could buy against a default, credit default, right? Um, but unfortunately, they became uh, speculative tools of destruction, kind of like, mm. kind of like um, what happens with uh, Ken Griffin and, and and others, not just Ken, but but Citadel and the issuing of of death spiral converts. Is these these credit default swaps? What happened is they would get issued, and and then. Hedge funds back, you know, a decade ago, I don't, almost two decades ago, would speculate on them and just mm. go naked short, which you weren't supposed to be able to do. You're supposed to have to own the underlying bond in order to write a, a contract against it. But they would just go naked short and they blew these spreads out. And if you remember the gold financial crisis, right? All the banks, particularly the US banks. I mean, it started with AIG, that was the first one, blew up. And then these things were going to 400, 500 basis points. And even the, the U.S. government credit default swap got, got up into, I don't know, maybe 80 or 100 basis points. It was crazy. And so basically all the banks started to fail and they all started to get merged together. And then things settled down and they passed a rule saying you can't, you can't go naked short these anymore. If you, you actually have to own the bonds in order to write the contract. So it, it settled things down. And, and we haven't heard about credit default swaps for a while. And actually, we hadn't heard about Boaz Weinstein for a while because he had a couple really crappy, that's a technical term, years. And But he got on the right side of, of this trade. And I haven't, mm-hmm. I haven't seen the exact numbers, but I think he's he's crushing it. So Yeah, he's doing well. Um, it, it's just, it's... it's uh... I, I want to like set the set the context for what I think is sort of is sort of happening here, and it does. You know, you, you've got some people out there, and it might make sense to talk about Balaji at some point because he, you know, kind of has Balaji is a very smart guy, you know, and he's come out and said, "Hey, I think Bitcoin's going to a million dollars in ninety days." Now, you know, to be totally clear, I don't think that at all, and it's hard for me to really understand what he's doing. I always like to say especially when it comes to smart people, like, what am I missing here? You mm-hmm. know, I, it's a, it's your knee jerk reaction to be like, that's a, that's dumb. But usually when I do that, it just means I'm missing something. So I, I'm not sure what I'm missing. Well, we're here, definitely, but- well, look, we're definitely missing something. And, and look, I've only met the guy once. Um, yeah. I will say it was kind of a surreal meeting. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 I, I it, it was just, it was just kind of this, this thing. He, he, had, he was in between, that Jobs, he had just left uh, Coinbase, and um, he says, "I just just um, come to this address." Said, okay, so I plug the address in, and the you know the lift is taking me all through the, the streets of San Francisco, and show up at this kind of newish. In fact, it didn't even like look completely finished condo building, mm-hmm. and um, he comes downstairs, um, you know. And meets me and he's wearing shorts and a t-shirt and you know, just seemed like a normal, normal guy. And we went over to a like a Whole Foods kind of place. And yeah. like back in it's just so it's just it was just kind of a surreal experience. And we talked about a lot of different things and venture capital and um 
but but he's a very like you say he's he is a very smart guy, really smart guy. Um, but he he has a uh, what would you call it? A little bit of a Socratic kind of professorial, and and you see it in his in his tweet threads. He he likes to lecture has a negative connotation, but I mean it in a positive way. He he likes to lecture or inform, and. I, I think he, I don't know. I I feel like when you start throwing around words like hyperinflation, I, I, just, I just feel like that's engagement farming. And I probably shouldn't say that, but I, I, I just, I, that, that's, that's how it strikes me because hyperinflation is one of those things where if you're a, if you're a third world country, um, with, without any kind of reserves or kind of stature in the global financial system, hyperinflation happens actually more often than we like to think, you know, think about Zimbabwe, yeah. you think about Argentina, you think about Venezuela, um, fine because, because they're, they're printing, they're literally printing so much money that you, you do need the wheelbarrow. The difference is super div- – and, and, and there should be, well, what about Germany? Well, Germany was one of developed, you know, ish uh, countries, but, mm-hmm. but the war and World War I and World War II. And so there's this, this set of circumstances that, that led – we didn't have – you know, there was no ECB there, you know, so I don't know. I, I get it that it, it's a word that people like to, to throw around and like to point to, to the Weimar Republic, but as the world reserve currency, I can't think of any examples of, of hyperinflations. Um, maybe I'm wrong. So I'm, but, I'm with you, Mark. I'm with you. And you know, you know what else too? It's kind of like, just play that out. You know, I mean, I think his point that he's trying to make is that there's more stress in the banking system than authorities are letting on and being honest about. And he's probably right about that. I mean, just look at what's, look at what's happening today. But at the same time, I I, I don't think he is right about that. I mean, Mm. there's a whole bunch of people who are starting to make that claim. I think he may have been first, but I, we talked a little bit about this last week. The difference is one, the amount of leverage. There's not the same amount, even Deutsche Bank, right? Mm-hmm. Is not as levered today as they were in GFC one. GFC one, Deutsche Bank, 42, 43 times levered. So think about that <laughs> in terms of of how much fractional reserve sorry, you have. In, that is That means they have crazy. two and a half percent equity. Two and a half percent equity. A normal-ish bank has somewhere between nine and eleven percent equity. Meaning, remember how it works, right? Someone puts in a dollar and right. you lend out, you know, 89 cents. Okay. Then they deposit the 89 cents and you lend out 90% of that. And you keep doing that, and, and you end up that fractional reserve piece, somewhere between nine, 10, 11 cents. And you get, you know, on a, a normal bank would be 10, 11, 12 times levered. Okay. That, that works. When you start going to 20 times levered, like Goldman and Morgan Stanley were, or 30 times levered, like Lehman was, but Deutsche Bank, whoo, kings. I mean, and there was probably even a time where they were creeping up on 50. But as I understand it, they're they're materially below that today. So one is there's less leverage. Two, the, the losses are different, right? An unrealized loss on an investment asset is very different than a real loss on a uh, loan asset, right? I mean, and 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 you 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 shared that, that. great yeah. graphic that I have used multiple times about you know green are your assets; those are the things that you own, either loans or as a bank. 
own uh, or or investments. Then you got the red, <laughs> which is deposits, which I actually think are green, but but they're they're the banks now, so they're the liabilities. And then the gold, and it's funny, someone someone watched our show and um, they thought I meant like real gold, like the banks had gold. I'm like, uh, I mean, it's the equity. Some of it could be gold, but but mostly it's not. But I just meant the color gold, like that picture that that you showed. Mm. And uh, in fact, I find that interesting that people can watch another piece of content. And they actually did a really nice job adding a whole bunch of different pictures and music. And but I that isn't kind of new content. That's just a weird thing to me. That's like when people quote other articles, like a, a reporter in Wall Street Journal writes an article and someone quotes that article as if it's like a new story. I'm like, can't do that actually unless you talk to me. Mm-hmm. So, um. Anyway, I lost my train of thought. But okay, so so I I don't think there's more stress in the system. What there is, and and you know, and everybody who listened last week knows how I feel about this. Banks are, by definition, right? By definition, confidence games. And when their systematic weakening of confidence. And what to me is different is not the the stress in the banking system. Well, okay. It is the stress in the banking system, but a different type of stress. It's a stress caused, I believe, by the virality of social interaction between members of the community. What I mean by that is every bank is a community. We're all community members and literally like that scene in It's a Wonderful Life where we all live and, you know, it used to be you lived in the town and everybody in the town was the community bank community. Well, now it's this global phenomenon. Like, you know, our former president had a big account at Deutsche Bank and, you know, got all kinds of stuff from them. And we got lots of people that are, you know, customers of Credit Suisse because they're trying to hide money in, in Switzerland. And you got, you know, plenty of people from Saudi Arabia who are customers of, you know, banks in the United States. And you got Chinese private equity firms that are customers of Silicon Valley Bank. So it's a global community. But man, the fragility caused by irresponsible, reckless, ill-intentioned, I believe, in many cases, venture capitalists and others who set off these these bank runs. And and I can only come to one conclusion with some of the evidence that I've looked at that it was intentional. That that's a big accusation, but and that's I haven't a- fingered anybody in particular, but I I can't look at the data that I have seen and come up with any other explanation. Then then it was intentional. Either you're short the security again, big accusation, not pointing finger at any individual, but this is weird. I, I just. But Mark, sorry, can I push back on that for a second? Because sure. if banking is so, you know, the banking system is like, that is what needs to function, right? People can't worry about their money. If that's so fragile that one or two individual people can start a panic such to the effect that it panics the global banking sector, and in, then what are we doing with this system? I have to ask that question because if it's if it's so fragile that one or two people, not even you know high level ranking government officials or something like that, just a couple of people can start a banking panic that undermines you know the security of the entire global banking sector, which every human on this planet depends on to live, then doesn't some part of you be like, what are we doing with this system then? Well, okay, fair, but let let's think let's let's unpack that. We we've, we've seen this movie before. 1907, Knickerbocker yeah. Panic. We had single person, arguably single person, but it's more than one person. But, you know, J.P. Morgan set off a pretty big panic, like like a, a legitimately big panic mm-hmm. where he and, and John D. Rockefeller. And and I guess I just learned this. I just learned this the other day that there was also um, a woman who, you know, weren't you, women weren't supposed to be traders back then, but there was this woman who had made a bunch of money and she helped um, 
uh, with the bailout. Or, you know, she she pledged some some assets to the bailout. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and I have to learn more about the whole story, but I just thought that was interesting. Um, but the couple things. One, markets were not as global and interconnected. I mean, there was there was global trade, but that was a period, you know, um, of, of kind of less global interconnectedness in, in the financial system. Uh, and you didn't also have the uh, the speed of transmission, you know, across borders. Um, and you probably didn't have the, the interconnectedness of the central banking systems. I mean, and not probably you didn't. Like, I, I, I read this this week that the Fed is now guaranteeing uh, uh, credit at other central banks. It's insane. So, okay. But, but, but my, point, my point is that I don't think it's changed. I, don't, I, I think the banking system, this fractional reserve system hasn't changed. And we've had runs on the bank before. And it does survive. But what, what happens is you get a reshuffling of where the assets go. Yeah. And the small banks, the less cap, less well capitalized banks fail. And it it creates this upward momentum and this concentration of assets in, in the few and the mighty. And just like in, in the global financial crisis one, we had a, we had a major global bank run and a whole bunch of banks failed and a whole bunch of banks merged into each other, but the same ones at the top stayed the top. Now, we're saying, but but okay, now you got a 167 year old institution like Credit Suisse just failed. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I would have to argue, yeah, that that is different. Um, so so let, maybe let me I just, just talk myself into into your point, Michael. That that <laughs> the look if a single tweet can what I'm, threaten a you know a model, a financial model. There, there's there's probably some things that now. I'm going to take the sinister side because we got to get sinister Saturday. <laughs> if what you wanted to do was issue a CBDC and have everybody want it, actually mm-hmm. crave it, this is what you would do. Okay. So you would foment I- fear in the current system. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you all for listening to On The Margin. Just wanted to give you guys a heads up about a conference that we have coming up in the new year called Permissionless. I'm sure most of you have been there last year. Uh, It is the cultural event of the year. We had over 5,500 people down in Palm Beach. This year, we are moving to Austin, Texas. You know what they say about Texas? Everything's bigger in Texas. Uh, so last year, we had a really great lineup of speakers. We had the two co-founders of Robinhood, Vlad Tenev and Baiju Bot. We had Chris Dixon. We had some of the folks that have been on the show a whole bunch of times, Jim Bianco, Dan Tapiero, just a phenomenal lineup of speakers. And you can expect the same this year. If you use Margin 10, you'll get 10% off on a ticket. Again, that's Margin 10 because I love you guys so much. Click the link at the bottom of the show notes. Hope to see you there in person. So I'm I'm going to come to the same conclusion from you from a, from a different side. I I think with with the banking sector... You know, we, we did this chart a couple of weeks ago, like we kind of looked at the history of the banking sector in the United States. You know, this is how many banks there used to be. This is how many banks there are today. And it's because financial panics are a direct result of human nature. Like we panic, like to, to your point, right? And, you know, Twitter and mobile banking is going to make this stuff way harder, but it's dy- dynamic that has existed you know, at least since, right, 19, you were just referencing something that happened in 1907, the Knickerbocker Trust, right? People go to the bank and it takes them a little bit longer, but a bank yeah. run is still a bank run and no bank survives a bank run. So this is a dynamic that existed forever. And the, the, the natural tendency, like a solution that has worked very well is to roll up smaller banks with bad or compromised assets into larger banks and a larger equity buffer can absorb those bad assets and it seems to work. Yep. But we're, we're reaching some kind of conclusion here where you know, eventually those those bad assets become someone else's liability. And then there's a very small number, you know, so there's this natural tendency. I, I don't think it's, I think it's, this is just industry dynamics, right? There's this natural tend to consolidate. And then you wind up with a couple of very important institutions, not to just like everyone, but to, to how society functions. And so I think 
And look, the the other thing that happened during the FOMC this week was Yellen testified because previously, and I think they've waffled on this. And I personally think what's going on in the halls of power, in the Fed, in the Treasury are, what are we going to do about these bank deposits? I actually thought Arthur Hayes did an interview with David Hoffman of Bankless, where I thought he described it extremely well. Mm -hmm. There was a loss in the banking sector. Now, to your point, it's a different type of loss than there was in, there's a difference between, you know, the type of loss that we have today. Mark to market. Mark to market. And it will depend on how much banks are forced to realize that loss, but there's still a loss. And then it's politically, where do you allocate that loss? Because, and, and there's a, it's complicated because there's a domestic set of banks, right? There's, um, you know, and, and they're different politically. They're, it's a very different charge thing, right? There's Silicon Valley Bank and Silvergate. They bank the tech bros. They bank the crypto bros. Like they deserve what's coming to them. Ooh, but then, you know who else banks? Uh, you know, farmers have banks too. And they bank small regional banks and those banks don't have mortgage-backed securities or treasuries. So are you going to let the farmers, the farmer regional banks fail? Because they can't use this BTFP facility. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side of the ocean, you have foreign central banks. And they're also dependent on this dollar system where they have US treasuries, where because of what the Fed is doing, you know, the value of those treasuries are plummeting. And what they, what the United States doesn't want people to do is sell treasuries into the open markets. So that's why they extend these swap lines. You know, so do you bail out? Where do you politically allocate the loss? Do you do it to foreign mm-hmm. central banks? Do you do it to the farmers bank in the United States? Do you do it to the Silicon Valley bank? This is a question that politicians have to decide. And now that the government has stepped in and meddled, no one's going to be happy because the perception is that it's unfair. So basically where I think this is all going is the intermediate step. And I wanted to show you this thread because I thought it was so good. Um, is It's this idea of credit rationing. And I'm borrowing this directly from... Dimitri and Russell Napier, mm-hmm. where basically, if you think about what the, the the dollar system is and the global banking system is, I was actually talking to Dimitri this week, he argued it's a very decentralized system, which is funny because we don't think about it like that in crypto land. But you do have bank, you know, credit creation does not actually happen at the central bank level. They try to influence credit creation, yep. but it happens actually at the commercial banking level. Um, and it happens domestically over here in the United States with our network of commercial banks. It happens internationally with this euro dollar banking system. And that's where credit is actually created. Now, the, the big problem is there's this inflation. So we've decided to hike rates and try to contract the form of credit. But as that's happened, parts of the system are breaking. So what the government is now doing is essentially rationing credit. Like Mm -hmm. you get a little bit of credit over here. You get a little bit of credit over here. If I like what you're doing, do do you see where this is kind of going? This is basically like, imagine this isn't credit. Imagine this is food, right? So that the government has, or the the central bank in this, in this instance has an enormous amount of power. That means they get to choke out credit to sectors or groups Mm -hmm. they don't necessarily like. Um, And they get to extend credit and therefore, you know, continue the survival of sectors that they think are important or that they politically like. And that I think paves the way for the CBDC. That I think is the dynamic that is starting to emerge, this idea of credit rationing. That's my yeah, look. I, I mean, hypothesis. again, no, a really important analysis. And it just goes back to this, why have we allowed you know, central bankers to, to create this much power? And the fact that you even you know, uttered the sentence that politicians get to decide. No, 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 no. The politicians, completely influenced and corrupted by lobbying, mm-hmm. bribery. Uh, so clearly, when Ms. Warren, you know, uh, I got some flack. Um, someone watched last week and they said, you said she was dumb. What, did I? Yeah, okay, probably I did. Um, but <laughs> you, <did. laughs> you know, truth is an absolute which, which I don't think. I think she's a savvy truth, politician. Truth is an absolute is what I defense. I, I I learned that, you know, that I can't be accused of slander if if it's true. Um so uh but to t- to my point, when I say dumb, I don't mean like unintelligent, I mean uh rules based, money based. If you're if you're owned by someone or some entity, I mean, and and this is just fact, right? It costs a hundred million dollars to become a senator in the United States. 
hundred million dollars. Most senators before they get elected do not have a hundred million dollars, correct? Mm-hmm. Many after they become senators become fabulously wealthy, but but before they're senators, they don't have that kind of money. So where do they get it? They have to raise it. Well, if you raise a hundred million dollars, my guess is the people who gave you that money expect a return on that investment. That's just that, you know, kind of kind of the way it works. So I when if if politicians are driving uh, decisions in financial markets, that's that's an inferior system. Uh, and it's been getting worse and worse and worse uh, for decades. So, but 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 that's actually only part of the problem. The real problem for me is how do you get someone to do something, just generally speaking, how do you get someone to do something that's painful or- Yeah, this or, is a great question. Or- mm-hmm. um, uh, bad for them or, uh, or like oppressive, like, like how do you get people to work out? It's painful. <laughs> I, it's painful to work out, right? How do you, how do you get I know. people to work out? Right. You know, you can threaten them, right? You can say you can incent them. You can get the carriage. Oh, I'll give you lower health insurance premiums or, uh, you know, I'll give you these little, these little, uh, uh credits on your, your stepping device or whatever. So there, there are lots of different ways you know, threaten people. Um, so if if we think about how many people listening to this podcast and, and beyond, how many people are going to sign up to have their money be controlled by someone else? Mm-hmm. Like literally, somebody could say, you know, I don't like the shirt you wore today. So your money's only worth 90 cents. And that's an extreme example, but you didn't you didn't pay your mortgage on time. So mm-hmm. your money's less good. You, you know, didn't vote for the right candidate. So your money's worth less. I, I don't know very many people who would sign up for that. How many people, and this is actually a real issue in this this part of my talk now is, is an issue that crypto needs to fix, and I actually think I might have met the guy this this week who who is going to fix it. Every transaction on a blockchain is public. That's an inferior system, right? Mm-hmm. How many people are going to sign up to use an asset where if I pay with with this unique asset, people can see my 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 income, the things that came into that account, they can see the things I bought mm-hmm. with it, like my whole transaction history. Like, I guess you can do this and I don't use Venmo, but you can do this with Venmo. Like you pulp your friend and see what they bought. And so, now I guess you can opt out of it maybe, but most people don't. And so you can see that, you know, Jimmy bought, you know, $10 to this uh, subscription service that, that probably doesn't look very good. Um, so <laughs> what, what, what subscription service? They were just bought by ethical venture capital, right? <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, sorry, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying it, it's just, I'm with you. I'm, it, I'm with you so, and you're, you're making a really important point. So sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean so, to laugh. No, yeah. but my, my point is that transparency and privacy and secrecy are different things. Yeah. Privacy, I believe, is a right. I believe we all have a right to privacy. I agree. I with that. should get to choose what other people know about me, about my life, about my my personal history, about my right. Yeah. It, when when people flex online, I got all this Bitcoin. Look at that, I just bought. You're inviting a five dollar wrench attack. Fine, great. Okay, big flex. Mm-hmm. People can find out where you live now and they can come steal your Bitcoin, but okay, fine, do that. But that's a choice people should be able to make. But it, if if everything is open and transparent and everybody knows, then I think some bad things will happen. So here, if a CBDC comes in and the government can see every transaction 
I make in real time, and then they have the ability to toggle on or off things they don't appreciate, like what happened with the truckers up in up in Canada. You just freeze my bank account with no due process. I don't know. I don't. I don't know anyone who would vote for that. I don't. I agree. Unless you made me so afraid that my money in the bank wasn't safe. But if I put it with the Fed, it'll be okay. <laughs> so, are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? It's not okay. It's not okay. And them telling you it's going to be okay is worse. And by the way, you, you said you heard from Ms. Yellen? You, you heard her speak or something? She, 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 she addressed that uh, this was during the FOMC. No, 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 no she, that can't be. That, that can't be. If it, she, there's another global financial crisis, she said there wouldn't be one in her lifetime, so she must be dead. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't believe she said that. Like, does she not believe in jinxes? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, all right. So I, I just, but, but again, it's all part of the narrative. This isn't a global financial crisis. This is not, everything's fine. Everything, this is literally Kevin Bacon at the end of Animal House. Remain calm, all is well. And then he's literally the next scene into the, the concrete. I mean, he's, and the special effects in the, this, uh, the 80s movies were so bad, but they're still, it's an amazing movie. I just watched it the other night. It's so good. So good. So, so I agree with you. I agree with you at the end point. I have slight I, 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 where yeah. I quibble with you is, is how we get there. But my, sure. I don't think I've ever articulated this, this worry to you, but my, my big worry, where, where, what I see kind of happening out there is like, I, I view a lot of this stuff through the lens of mistakes that we've made in the United States and this great power competition in China. So I, I'm still shocked and, and kind of like a little upset at just the situation that my generation has been left with. Like, I can't believe the decisions that were made about, the debt, and we're going to have to figure that out. And all these people that say government financing isn't like household financing, that is like the most ridiculous, you know, non-first principles thinking I've ever heard in my life. Uh, so I, I, I flat out disagree with that. It is yep. like it. You can just delay the inevitable for a longer period of time. So there's an enormous amount of debt and there are problems that were made over here in the United States. You know, if you read Ray Dalio's book, you know, you about these like short term debt cycles versus long term debt cycles, ultimately deleveraging that has socio political impacts. And then usually what happens there is you look for an external boogeyman. You got bad stuff happening here. You look for a common enemy. You know, and I look at all this stuff going yep. on with China. We've got the Chips Act. We're going to ban TikTok. You know, there's been this this hostile rhetoric, all this stuff. And what I worry about is is this, this competition, you know, being used as a way to solve these internal problems in the United States. And, you know, I, I don't buy into the narrative that the United States is this incompetent. I think actually, if we wanted to turn it on, we really could turn it on. And I think we're still the dominant superpower. But what happens is, you know, politicians have this, this mantra, never let a good crisis go to waste. Go to waste. So my, my big worry, my big worry is that we through the lens of, hey, we got to compete with China. This is the thing that we need to worry about. And by the way, in order to successfully compete with China, I need everyone on my team. And to your point, all the money needs to go into the Fed. I need, I need, you know, for whatever reason, they're going to connect this power competition with, I need perfect transition, you know, transparency into everyone's bank account and all this stuff. And, and then in trying to defeat China, we become more like that system, which, you know, I've, I've no, no shade, whatever, but I, I don't like the system. I don't like what I know about how the, the CCP runs things over there. I, I love living here in this country, and I, I want to keep the system that we have. And I think it's really important to push back against status quo powers and people that want to override that stuff. So I would quibble yeah. with you about how we get there, but I see the same destination as you, and I'm no, really I, I, concerned I, about it. I, I'm very worried. Couldn't, could not, could, I couldn't agree more. And look, and I've, I've talked about this over and in fact, I've talked about it so many times people say, I'm just, I'm sick of you saying it, Yusko, right? You know, Portuguese had the first world reserve currency because they had the tallest trees and had the fastest ships. It was all about ships and naval superiority. Spain takes them over. France takes them over. The Rothschilds come in and the Netherlands. Think about that. The Netherlands. I know. 
how big is the Netherlands? It's like <laughs> smaller than Durham. I mean, it's not really, but it's just not very big. And yet global superpower and, and financed a whole bunch of wars and amazing. Um, and we talked last week, right? I mean, the single family, Rothschild family, single family. It's a big family, big, big. Equal to three quarters of the people, bottom three quarters of the people on the planet. That wealth, one family. Unbelievable. So Netherlands, then some of the Rothschilds slip up to the UK, and then the UK's got it, and they get steamships, fast ships. Then we come along, and Oppenheimer, new movie, right? And mm-hmm. we create nuclear subs. So now we're the superpower. All about naval superiority. And I remember being, I was on a panel with, with um, uh, the guy who was known to be, um, and I feel badly because I, I like him, um, Gartman. Uh, he was the Jim Cramer before Jim Cramer. So whatever Gartman said, everybody said, oh God, the opposite's gonna happen. And so I was on, on, a, on a panel with, with him and, you know. One quick second. Did you see that there's actually an inverse Kramer ETF? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's like it's like one of the best investments out there. Um, you know, it's just, he's he's done a lot with his life. He's a successful guy. I Sure. You know, I I know that the thing is to, you know, can poke fun at him, which is which is all well and good, but I have respect for the guy. Well, but, but here, here's the thing. What he does is incredibly hard. I know. Yeah, right? it's so hard. To 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 be live and to to have the randomness of whatever story is hot, whatever company is hot, you have to have an answer and you have to sound convincing and and here's the thing. Remember, and nobody ever does, that the best investors of all time. The best investors of all time. George Soros, Julian Robertson, Michael Steinhardt. I mean, Stanley Druckenmiller. 58% of the time are they right. That means they're wrong 42%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just think about that. Let's say Jim's not quite as good as those guys. Okay, let's say he's just 50-50. So at least half the time. And remember, we have selective memory. If you watch him for an hour and he says 10 things we as humans will remember the things that get you know reinforcement within a short period of time so if it happens that it's the negative and then once that that reputation so we just ignore all the things he gets right which he gets right a lot of things actually yeah. and we just focus on the negative it's 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 like what your twitter stream does to you it feeds you information to support the biases that you have by all your likes and then excludes all the data that would kind of say, maybe you should rethink that. But, um, oh, so I was, I was just doing this thing. And, and what Gartman said is China can never be a superpower. They have one aircraft carrier and they don't even know how to land planes on it. A plane crashed into the side of it. I'm like, you know, we probably had planes crash on the side of our aircraft carriers, I bet. Um, mm-hmm. uh, they're not all Top Gun, uh, Maverick. But so he said, there's no way. I, and my view, and I, I still believe this, is nope. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, probably even 20 years ago, China figured out the next war is not a kinetic war. It's not fought with ships. It's fought with chips. And everything in the last 20 years has been about getting superiority in cyber and and power around computing. And that's why China leads in AI. It's why they lead in 5G. It's why they actually lead in CBDC. It's why they lead in surveillance, why you have to have your little code to go into the rest, you know, the grocery store. They have the, you know, caged cities, none of which I want. And freaking I dystopia, right? I mean, I haven't, we have an office in Shanghai. I haven't, I haven't been to China in three years. And I, and we're, we're talking about doing our annual meeting there in the fall. And I, I'm not sure I want to go. I mean, I do think there's yeah. incredible investment opportunity there, but I, I just, but anyway, so here's, here's my, my point on that. 
we are behind. Mm. Fact, we are behind in those areas of chip superiority. And we're trying to catch up because we don't want to lose this war, this cyber war. And I mean, TikTok was TikTok was the equivalent of Germans going through the Russian front. Mm. Think about that. What did they do? They infiltrated our society and collected data and information. Don't on we do us that to our I know. Willingly. <laughs> and and the TikTok in China. What do they do with TikTok in China? Educational programs. Like 40% of it has to be educational programs and it actually turns off after a certain number of hours. I pray, I pray for that. He said, it would stop the fight with my 12 year old every night. Not, not TikTok in particular, but, but just holy moly, they, they know how to use the tech and they're using it against us. And now, quote unquote, we're going to ban it. Well, no, we're just going to replace it with our own version to- Of it. Yeah. I agree with you. I, I mean, look, I, th I think we're living in the era of social media like that was cigarettes before filters were invented. That's my yeah. that's my framework. That's I, I think they will come out with sensible rules about you know something. I want to, mm -hmm. before we get too far down that lane, though, I want to ask your opinion on the- uh, because this is the big question, right? And I, I kind of have my own thoughts and opinions on this. But so we we got this new facility, right? The BTFP, um, mm -hmm. the Bank Term Funding Program. And what that has meant Does is- it stand for by the freaking politician? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> it might. It might. In two years, it might. But it, what, what, has, what it has led to is the, the amount of assets that are held on the Fed's balance sheet has gone up drastically. And it's right. actually reversed, you know, two thirds of the quantitative tightening that they've done. So part of that is part of that is through the BTFP, just a loan facility, which allows banks to deposit treasuries or mortgage backed securities. And they're only trading at 80 cents on the dollar. The, the Federal Reserve is going to give them 100 cents on the dollar, which, by the way, is a form of unsecured lending. Uh, because you are not, you are depositing or, or under collateralized, I should under say collateralized under, lending, under yes. collateralized lending. Yep. Um, and then there's also just the discount window. So the feds opened up the discount window and the combination of the discount window plus the BTFP has, you know, the banks are using it. The banks are using those facilities. Well, Mike, well, look, we, we talked about this. Japan. Yeah. In 2007. Okay, it's a long time ago, yeah. 16 years ago, said no more QQE because they call it mm -hmm. QQE, qualitative and quantitative easing. No more QQE. No more, no more balance sheet growth, Bank of Japan. It was about 100% debt to GDP. Um, 225 mm. today. So they've been doing QQE since 2007. And what happens if you go back in that 2007 period and you look, the Bank of Japan actually did have a little tiny hook down in how many securities they had on their balance sheet. And then it went straight back up. And if you look, mm -hmm. if you look at the chart, I mean, it's been going around, everybody's seen it. You know, you got the, the QT kind of nice gradual decline and then boom. I mean, like this, it's a vertical spike. It was the largest increase in the Fed balance sheet in one week in history, which is saying something. Boom. And they're, look, they are called the lender of last resort, LOLR, um, which is kind of funny, LOL in there. Um, but uh, it's not R-O-T-F-L, but close. Um, but here's the thing. There is zero question. Mark, you can't say zero. I'm going to say zero. There's zero percent question, zero question, that the Fed is going to own them all. Mm. They're going to own them all. They're going to own all the debt, all of it. 
just like the ECB is going to own all of Europe's. Okay. Deutsche Bank will get fixed this weekend. Bitcoin's going to go up a lot this weekend. Okay. And central banks are going to own it all. And then they're going to start doing jubilees. Japan will be first. The US will be second. Europe will be third. And they'll start over. And then we'll be paying $18 for a Coca-Cola. And we'll think it's normal. And it's the nonsense of it all. Meaning, And what I mean by nonsense is it is nonsensical to think that you can print money, buy an asset, particularly now you're buying an asset for 100 cents that's worth 80. Now, it will be eventually worth 100, but, but who's going to honor that 100? Because the budget doesn't balance. This, this is the, the, the lunacy of all of it. At, at current interest rates, the amount of money going to service the debt it starts to erode your ability to ever retire the debt. And it's, it's like, look, 40% of the S&P 1500, 40%, okay, that's a big yeah. ass number, can't service their debt with their current EBITDA. Forget paying that debt back. They could never pay it back. They can't even pay the interest. Yeah. That's where the so, government's going. Okay. So let me ask you this because, you know, this is not the like podcast thing to say, right? This BTFP is the facility that launched a thousand macro podcasts. And I've listened to a lot of them. Is this QE? Is it not QE? Right. Look, look, call it whatever oh, what acronym word soup you want. That number on the Fed's balance sheet keeps going up. I There's a different explanation every time. There's a different reason for why it's not systemic, why it's not going to continue, why this isn't liquidity positive, why, 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 whatever. It, you know, that number keeps going up. And I think the important thing to recognize, like my the way that I look at that is that dynamic of rolling up uh, you know, smaller financial institutions who have bad assets into bigger balance sheets. That's what central banks are doing. That's Michael, what they're doing. Riddle me this. Yeah, I'm stuck on the Batman thing today. <laughs> did did Bitcoin get 20% better in the last month? Did it no, but, did, did, did his hash power improve by 20%? Did did it get 20% better at solving algorithms? I mean, did did something change in Bitcoin by 20% in the last four weeks? Mm -hmm. No. The money got worse. The money S got worse. So and, and that's gonna keep happening because the balance sheet expansion of global central banks. Mm -hmm is going to continue. This is like the old, the beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm with you. And by the way, guys, uh, Brent Johnson has been on this show. So if you want an explanation for the tension in between a company, or sorry, a country's bond market and their currency, go back and listen to what Brent says, because he outlines it better than anyone that I've heard explain this. But that's what we're talking about here and describe. But my, my question to you, Mark, is, because I'm trying to play this out in my head, and I think the inevitable thing that's going to happen here is, to borrow Luke Groman's phrase, they're going to try to ride two horses with one ass. They're going to have their <laughs> cake and eat it too, right? They want to make, they, you know, what, what, oh, what, Luke, for the win. What financial gravity, what the laws of financial physics says is you need to sacrifice one. You need to sacrifice the currency or the bond market. And I think authorities for a period of time are going to say, I don't want to make, I refuse to make that choice. I'm going to try to do, and they're going to try to do uh, yield curve control. And they're going to try to uh, ban the exit ramps, which is, you know, I know that some people don't think this. I think that is what's going on with crypto right now. I think they're trying to limit okay. people's ability to exit fiat currency. And that's or Executive Order 6102. They did that in the 30s, FDR, April 5th, which is Satoshi's birthday, which is pretty cool. But that, so I think what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to ban Bitcoin. They've already, you know, neutered gold as, as, an, as the, the ability of gold to do this. And I think they're going to try to do YCC and financial oppression. My question to you is, do you think that's going to be successful? I mean, this has been a meme, but I've, I was shocked and frankly, pretty scared to figure out that regulators, leaders of banks had never considered the impact that mobile banking would have on bank runs. That was like a, I know people are kind of joking about this. That was like an eye-opening thing for me that 
they didn't even consider that. Now, I think what's going to happen is they're not going to come out and announce this. They're not going to call it, we're doing yield curve control. They're, but they're generally, what they're going to try to do is find a way to have bonds trade where they want bonds to trade at and have yields do what they want to do. And there, there's going to be this word soup of confusing facilities. Yeah. You know, no, that's, I mean, but yes. is it going to work? Is it no, going to no, work? Because no, no. Yes, 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 it will work. Hmm. With consequences. The consequences are that uh, the money, currency, let's call it currency because it's not money. Money is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. That would be gold, Bitcoin, a couple other things. But Inside money, exists. outside money. Pardon? I don't know if you've ever heard Perry Merling's uh, description of this, inside money, outside money. Yeah. So well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking currency. Currency that we all use, right? Dollars, euros, yen, whatever, whatever happened, you, wherever you happen to be listening to this, um, it's going to devalue. And, and, and it has been forever, right? Mm. I mean, that is the nature of currency. 775 paper currencies in the history of the world, three quarters no longer exist. The oldest is the pound sterling. And then, you know, all the others. And, and they just keep devaluing. Now, does that mean you go out of business? No. No. I, I think about think about the generations. Think about your grandparents. They bought homes for five thousand dollars. They bought cars for a few hundred bucks. They paid a nickel for Coca-Cola. And they had a great life. And your parents, they bought houses for one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, and they, you know, got paid a salary of thirty thousand dollars a year, and they paid seventy-five cents for Coca-Cola. And now you and you know my kids, you buy a house for five hundred thousand dollars if you're lucky, because most can't afford to even buy that. Uh, that's starter home. In most places, uh, there are pl plenty of places where you can't even get a five hundred thousand dollars house. Ch try Chapel Hill. My, my daughter and son in law trying to buy a house can't find anything. I mean, like literally can't find anything in Chapel Hill that is you know sub eight hundred nine hundred thousand dollars. They just don't even build them. So, but we all think that's normal. Our lives are good. Look, I I am grateful every day. I am grateful every day I wake up. More grateful two days ago when I woke up in Park City with a foot of new snow and had like one of the most glorious ski days in my life. And by the way, do you know who this is? Do you know who that guy? How, is that Howard Marks? That is Howard Marks. Okay. Yeah. That is Howard Marks. So mm -hmm. this happened. So I'm out in Park City at a crypto hedge fund annual meeting. And uh, we're sitting down, Apre Ski. Having having drinks, and I get invited Howard, to one of these opera ski. I don't get invited to one of these opera ski things. This, this I, sounds nice. I, this I, sounds I, like I a nice scene. Yeah, you know, it was amazing. It was amazing, and I I didn't see it happen, but they said Howard was walking by with his wife and and grandkids, and he looked over and I guess he recognized me and and he said you you guys go ahead, and he came around the corner. Again, he was behind mm. me, and there was a seat open next to me. And he, they said it was like, it was like when when we all approached the cool kid table in high school. You're like, kind of, you kind of want to approach, but you're not sure if they're going to invite you. This is a multi billionaire, one of the most legendary investors in the history of the world. I mean, he is definitely top ten investor in the world, and he's sheepishly coming up to the table. And I turn, I, I see him. I, Oh my gosh, sit down. He said, hey, what what can can I join? I'm like, yeah. And so he he kind of nudges up and doesn't actually sit down. I said, well, what are you guys talking about? And I said, well, you know, we're talking about state of crypto markets. And I said, you know, since you're here, you know, and, and I had met with him three years ago when we launched our first fund. He and I go way back, and he wasn't ready. Let's just say he wasn't ready. He was not a big fan uh, of what we were doing in, in venture. And his son, pretty into it, but like, well, I would like to learn some more about, about this. So then he sat down, 
15 minutes in, takes off his sweater. An hour. We spent an hour orange, not, not just orange pilling, but just generally blockchain technology. One of the one of the two portfolio managers, young guys that, that run this, this fund called Permian, told Howard about how this is as big as electricity. You know, electricity allowed us to do things faster, to move energy faster. But there were a lot of people who said, electricity, no, burns houses down. I don't like it. I'm not using it. I like candles. They're, they're, they're perfectly fine. They're perfectly adequate. And uh, it was funny. The lights right above us as he's telling the story were candelabras with, you know, they looked like candles, but they were electric, right? But they were trying to hearken back to the, the days of old. Days and of yore. long story short, Howard engaged with this mm. group of 20-somethings and 30-somethings for an hour. And we had dialogue and debate in search of truth about crypto, blockchain, the future of finance, the future of investing. It was one of the greatest things I've experienced in a long time. And I'm begging. I'm, I'm like, Howard, please, please do one of your memos about this conversation. It would be epic. I agree. I agree. I, you know. You know what? Look, the eventually, I have an enormous amount of faith that we will get there. It's just going to take a long period of time. And you know what? To actually, and I, I know we've got to wrap after this, but to actually yeah. try to like put myself in another, you know, in the shoes of of the other group that I'm kind of criticizing on the show. Look, the system that has worked for a long period of time of governance is hey. Uh, you know, for whatever there's a there's a there's a logical reason, by the way, why governments do this. Like, I don't think it's like some laziness or or stupidity or anything like that. Other governments extend too much credit. That makes other the other governments that say, "Hey, we're going to get behind if we don't extend the same amount of credit." Anyway, whatever ends up happening is enormous amount of credit is built up. Everyone understands that they can't pay that back, and then there's this, uh, you know, there's a deep, there's financial oppression, and it's not very pleasant, but it's kind of a reset that allows people to to to. to start over. And that's been the system for a long time. And whether or not people understand that or not understand that that's the system. And now there's this group of people that are saying, I don't want to be a part of that system. That doesn't, you know, I didn't make those decisions. And governments are saying, well, guys, like this is how it works. Like this is what we do at this period of time. And so I, I have empathy. I get, I get both sides. I understand both sides, but I'm also saying, I don't want to, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry. I'm if there's this other option and I, I, I don't yeah. want to be a part well, of it. But here's anymore. the funny thing in the 20s. And they have to adapt and they have to adapt. No, like in, but in the twenties, we talked about millions. JP Morgan bailed out the banking system in 1907 for $25 million. Okay. In the seventies, we talked about billions the famous quote from the senator, billion here, billion there. Pretty soon you're talking about real money. Now we talk about trillions. I think Mitt Romney said that actually. <laughs> yeah. Originally? He got crap. I think he, I, that's who I attribute that quote to. I think he got a lot of flack. Nah, for saying that. I think it's way before him. But Maybe it is. Um, I'll double check. I'll, 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 I'll Snopes that or whatever. Um, but I, uh, I don't think Mitt was first. Uh, I think Hold it's way before second. him. But, um, but. Yeah, right. uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. but now we talk about trillions, and it's just it's beautiful. It's adding a zero. And remember, you know, we were the first. I think we were the first podcast. I shouldn't say the first, but I, we we're one of the first. Maybe maybe we were the first to, to call crypto a winner. You were you were call, on that. I'm gonna call crypto summer. I'm calling it. I'm on. I'm, I'm with you there. It. May 9th is the day. Happens to be my birthday, but May 9th is the start of crypto summer. And it's actually my 60th birthday, which is kind of cool. Um, wow. But I know, wow, wow. Yeah, you're old. Um, but but here's the thing: millions, billions, trillions. We add a zero every having. Mm. 10 to 100, 100 to a thousand, thousand to ten thousand. This is this is the hundred thousand. And it's because we add a zero, millions, billions, trillions. Life is good, grateful every day. 
we will appreciate the higher prices and, and the less value for our money, but that's the way it works. And the yeah. reset, the big reset is coming. Unfortunately, the grift will happen. The politicians will get rich. They'll take their, you know, their cut, but still pretty awesome system. Yeah. So far. Until CBDCs, you. then, then the shit gets real. So that's a topic for another day. I'm with you on that. All right, Mark, this has been a really fun one. I will see yeah. you here same time next week, my friend. Best hour of my week. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Michael.